Good evening to everyone that's here so far. We're just going to wait for a couple more minutes because we've only seem to have half the people that have booked on yet. So we'll just wait um, for a few more minutes for everyone to arrive. We'll just give it a couple more minutes. It is water, not a large tumor. <laughs> Okay, well, it is um, gone half past an hour. I think there's a few people still joining in, but we'll we'll get going. So thank you everybody um, for joining us this evening. Um, this is our first talk in a programme of online talks that have been organised by our trust uh, volunteer run local groups. Uh, my name is Harriet and I work for the Leicestershire Remotland Wildlife Trust. And it's a pleasure to have you all here this evening. Um, so I'm just going to go through a couple of sort of housekeeping bits um, before we get going. Um, so everybody's video will remain off throughout the talk and you'll be muted. Um, this is just to make it a bit easier for uh, Julia's video and ensure there's no feedback or um, anything like that. If you have any questions throughout the talk, if you just pop them in the Q&A box um, at the bottom of the page, and then at the end of the talk, we'll go through um, as many as we have time for. So we'll leave about 10, 15 minutes at the end for some questions. Okay, so I'll now pass over to you, Frank, who's from our OD and Winston local group, um, who've organized the talk this evening. Okay, Frank. 
Well, hello. Isn't it great that we can all meet this way? I'm Frank, Event Secretary for Obi and Wigston Local Group, as Harriet just mentioned. And I'm really excited to be able to introduce our speaker for the first of what looks set to be a terrific season of illustrated wildlife talks, making up for our inability to meet in our usual venues. <clears throat> Sorry that some have been disappointed. Uh, we had 100 people registered to, to see this. I hope the rest are just having, um, just on their way in. Um, uh, and uh, if you if you know how to do it, if you look at the um, YouTube channel for this, for, for the Leicester and Rutland Wildlife Trust, you should be able to view this live on our YouTube channel. channel. Um, uh, and it'll be recorded and shown afterwards, available afterwards as well. Um, anyway, enough from me. You're here to hear Julia Hawley talking about farming for wildlife on a small mixed family farm near Melton. So, Julia. Thanks very much, Frank, and uh, thank you, Harry, as well. We have the technology, so let's hope that it works. So yeah, I'm going to talk about uh, farming and wildlife on our farm near Melton Mowbray. Just a bit of background about myself. Um, I actually grew up in the West Midlands and was lucky enough to live on the fringes of the wild forest near Bewdley. And from about the age of 15, I started getting involved with voluntary work in the National Nature Reserve there um, under the old Nature Conservancy Council warden, um, John Robinson, who was um, quite a formative influence on me. And I've always been really interested in integrative land use, so using land not just for production agriculture um, or purely for conservation wildlife, but combining um, multiple uses of, of land. So without further ado, I'll turn to our farm at Brentby. I appreciate some of you will have heard me speak before. Um, so uh, some of the slides may be familiar, but some of them are definitely new. So um, we farm in the title uh, Hamlet of Brentby. Um, and uh, it's about 270 acres in total, which isn't particularly big by today's standards. Uh, Brentaby, as I said, is a tiny little place with our farmhouse, uh, what used to be a, a, a little chapelry next door, which is now a, a converted church, and then just a little cluster of, of houses and a few other farms. Of our 270 acres, uh, just under two thirds is permanent pasture. And you can see we've got some quite spectacular good old fashioned Leicestershire rig and furrow uh, on a lot of our land, um, which hasn't been improved. It um, was originally in medieval times plough land and it was ploughed with medieval plough, which is what form, formed those beautiful reverse S shapes with a single furrow uh, oxen plough. And then at some point, probably around the time of the Black Death, it was grassed down and it's never been ploughed since. And of course, much of the heavy land across the East Midlands, Leicestershire, Northamptonshire, um, parts of Nottinghamshire were covered in this sort of agriculture um, until World War II. And then during World War II, a lot of it was, was then ploughed out and converted to um, crop production in, in the uh, Plough for Victory campaign to stop the country from, from starving. Uh, and then some of it since then has, has also been lost. As I say, we've got almost two thirds of the farm still in this, in this lo lovely rig and furrow. We have the River Eye running through the farm, not to be confused with Eye Brook, which is down in the southeast of the camp. And the River Eye uh, becomes the River Ree because it runs through Mount Mowbray. And it is a triple S I on the stretch that runs through our ground. So this is a site of special scientific interest. And it was designated largely because of the range of flora that live within the river. With so much permanent pasture, um, obviously we need livestock to graze it. And we have um, a small herd of, uh, sorry, a more small flock of uh, a commercial sheep. Uh, a lot of the, the permanent pasture is away from the farm buildings. We have a long thin farm. So it's too far away from the farm buildings for our milking herd to access on a daily basis. So we have um, sheep down there. And in the summertime, some of our young stock and, and dry cows that aren't in milk actually go down onto the onto the river grazing. 
until this year, we had a small area of apple land. But I mentioned that not all the farms in permanent pasture. We have about 100 acres uh, that is cultivated, either used to grow intensive grassland, or we used to grow about 25 acres of cereals, usually winter wheat. I'm sure you're all aware that last autumn was spectacularly wet. It started uh, raining on the 22nd of September, which I remember clearly, A, because it's my birthday, and B, because it was the harvest festival in our local church, which have a leaky roof because metal thieves had, had visited, and our community harvest lunch was uh, ruined by water coming through the roof on the 22nd of September. And then it hardly stopped raining all autumn, so in common with many farms across Leicestershire, uh, we didn't actually manage to get any autumn crops sown. Um, on our land, our heavy land, it's quite difficult to sow spring crops successfully, uh, so we actually put the whole farm down to grass for the first time uh, this year. But um, that does actually have implications for the wildlife on the farm as well. And I, I stated that we have some intensively managed grassland. So our main enterprise is a herd of about 90 black and white Holstein Friesian cows. We produce milk, blood, salt and dairy. And the um, modern grassland is there primarily to provide the winter silage for our cows to eat in wintertime. In the summer, they are grazed. And as you can see in this picture, it's not actually pure ryegrass. It's um, a, a mix with white clover. So white clover obviously has the benefits of um, fixing nitrogen or the bacteria in the root nodules fix nitrogen for us, which re reduces the need for artificial fertilizers. It's actually really nutritious in its own right. And of course, it's fantastic for pollinators. Uh, this that time of year, the photo was taken, which was sort of late July. Uh, when you walk through a sward like that with so many white clover flowers on it, it's literally buzzing with bees, which is greatly appreciated by our local beekeepers. Uh, clover also has the benefits of being um, quite good at, in at quite high levels of trace elements as well. But as I mentioned, those for us are not advantage for the cows to eat in, in winter. So then usually mown in uh, late May, weather dependent, and then again in early July, uh, and then again in the, in the autumn. Uh, and hopefully that provides us with most of the winter fodder requirement for the cows. But around any of the fields that we do farm intensively, we have a, um, a buffer of rough grassland. Uh, in places, this is relatively wide. So in this picture, you can see we're actually next to a stream, which is where the trees are. And there is a slight slope in the ground rising up to the left. And so if we have really heavy rain in, in wintertime or even in summer, we can get some surface runoff of, of, of soils. So by having a bit of a buffer zone there, it means that any uh, soil particles that are picked up by the runoff will be trapped in the buffer zone and won't actually go into the stream, which then goes down into the river, which, as I stated, is a triple SI. Of course, this has fantastic benefits for wildlife as well. So these rough margins, uh, then we didn't actually sow them. They're, they're just a, a regenerated, a self-regenerated mix of of uh, wild grass, as you can see, it's quite a lot of sticky cockroach in there. They're full of invertebrates, you get lots of beetles and things in the bottom. Uh, of course, they're very good for small mammals, so we get all sorts of uh, voles and mice in them, which in turn provides um, food for our birds of prey. Uh, we do have hares on the farm, not for the arable lands near us. And some of our adjacent neighbours have got largely arable farms and there are lots of hares on them. Um, but we do have a few around the farm um, and again they like some areas of long grass, um, either in the margins or sometimes we find them in the hay meadows uh, where they can squat down and they really do sit tight. Occasionally I've almost trodden on them when I've been walking around. Um, but uh, it's always nice to see them around. We have loads of rabbits, uh, but it's nice to see the hares. Whenever we've got grass, and I mentioned we, we do get a range of invertebrates, I am very much a generalist and an amateur naturalist, not a specialist by any means. Um, I came across this one just a couple of days ago. So having looked it up, um, I think this is a, a four spot orb weave spider, which apparently likes long rough grassland. And although this was in a field that the cows are grazing, it had had a, a cover of um, quite tall weed growth. This is what happens um, when you try and uh, sow grass in the spring. 
uh, you tend to get a different flush of weeds to autumn sown grasslands. So we've actually mown the grass with a, a lot of weeds in it um, and the cows were then picking over the mowings. And when we moved the electric fence, I went to pick this one up and found this beauty on it. I think it's extremely attractive. And I mentioned earlier that because we have lots of small mammals around and plenty of beetles, um, then we do get a, a, a range of different um, predatory birds. So we're always pleased to see breeding barn owls on the farm. Uh, we've always had little owls, but we did notice probably a couple of winters ago that um, they disappeared. We have got some back now, um, but whether that was climate related, it certainly wasn't just lack of habitat or, um, uh, or, or um, animals to feed on. There's uh, nothing had changed in, in that respect. Um, so it, it might have been a reflection of, of some hard weather at some point. Uh, and then we do have tawny owls. We don't actually have any large blocks of woodland, but there are some woodlands fairly close by. And we do have a few small spinnies on the farm. So we do hear the, uh, the, the tawnies. And it's usually about this time of year, a little bit later, when the, the young tawnies are sort of kicked out of territory by their parents. Uh, it, it gets quite noisy. As, uh, as and again, because we have areas of, of long grass and we have lots of different areas of water, we've got uh, several small ponds as, uh, as well as the river, then we do get grass snakes. Um, for several years, I'd seen the grass snake eggs and I'd seen cast skins and I'd seen them slithering away or heard them slithering away in the long grassland, but I've never managed to get a photo. Uh, and then um, a few years ago, on a hot sunny afternoon, just after a heavy shower of rain, I opened the kitchen door and found this under the porch staring at me, um, which did make me slam the door quite quickly, just as an instinctive reaction. But then just thought, oh, it's only a grass snake. But at least I was able to go and get my camera um, and at last get my, my picture of a grass snake. But it's actually really the, the fact that we are busy farming most of the time. We are a, a working commercial farm. This is our, this is our income, this is our livelihood. Uh, livestock in particular um, tend to, to dictate the timetable because um, the, the livestock always come first. So unfortunately, I don't have as much time as I'd like to actually walk around the fields, go bird watching, go uh, nature spotting in the habitats that we created. So it's quite nice when they literally come to the doorstep. Um, not a terribly tidy. For those of you that have gardens, this is one of the things that can make a great big difference. The amount of wildlife coming to your farm is have a little area of, 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 of wilderness, um, of, of untamed um, natural vegetation. I appreciate it might not be as big as this. This is literally just a great big clump of brambles on, um, on quite a, a, a small steep bank in the main cow grazing field and there's a few hawthorns in the background. And um, this is one of my easiest to access blackberry patches. And I know some people say, oh, you shouldn't pick the blackberries, leave them for the birds. I can assure you this is over 12 foot high. I am only five foot six. So there are plenty of blackberries at the top of the birds. And this is just one of many patches uh, around the farm. We do get quite a lot of um, uh, blackberries on the hedges as well, because we don't trim our hedges every year. So uh, it will vary around the farm where they are, but there are blackberry patches in, actually in the hedges as well as this, which is actually in a, in a field. So I had my first blackberry and apple crumble about uh, two weeks ago. And because we've got little areas of wilderness and lots of, of rough untended areas, then um, for probably the last four or five years, we've, we've seen hedgehogs. Um, and this year we were really, really pleased to see some hoglets as well. Um, unfortunately, um, we did notice that, first of all, the adult that we've been feeding every day or every evening um, uh, with cat food outside the kitchen door disappeared. Um, and then about a week later, the hoglets uh, disappeared. And I did actually find um, some hedgehog skins. So they had been unfortunately predated. And we haven't actually seen any hedgehogs since. Um, hopefully we will get them back again because we're certainly providing the habitat. We managed the farm with the help of um, a taxpayer funded scheme, which is um, administered through DEFRA, the um, government department. And um, we have elected to go into this scheme. It's not compulsory. And we get paid for all sorts of different environmental management around the farm. 
And one of the boxes we ticked was that we would provide um, some crops purely for pollinators and also to provide bird seed for the birds to eat in the winter. As I've said, we're not largely an arable farm, so our areas tend to be quite small, but they are still beneficial. So this is uh, this year's um, pollinator and bird area. So we've got lots of borage in our air. I'm sure you, a lot of you know that borage is very, very good for, for pollinators. Uh, there is some white flowers there, which are buckwheat, uh, which is grown primar primarily for the seed for the birds. And there are some sunflowers there, uh, which are fantastic again for, for bees and other insects. And they will be left in situ for the birds to help themselves uh, to the seed when it's, uh, when it's there. Another of our areas, this isn't so much for the pollinators, but just purely for bird seed. So um, this is actually a mix of triticale, which is the cereal. Um, you can see the, uh, the, the ears there. And then right in the middle, the, the yellowy orange plant is quinoa, quinoa, uh, which is like a glorified fat hen. And it provides lots and lots of small seeds uh, for, for birds. And then uh, there is a small amount of kale in this mix as well. And kale again provides uh, a small seed on the second year's growth. So this particular mix would be in for two years. You've got that mix of the larger seeds from the cereals and, and the smaller seeds to help support a variety of different birds. As I said, we don't have any um, large woodland areas. We have a few spinnies of mature trees. And then we do have a few little awkward field corners that we've planted up. Um, so the big tree in the background is actually an old um, uh, crab apple in, in the hedge. And then we have planted a, a younger crab apple, a field maple, some hazel, um, and then there is an oak tree just out of out of sight as well. So we're just excluding the livestock from this area. Um, and so we planted the trees as, as uh, two year old saplings. And this was actually taken a few years ago. So it's just a nice little field corner. And I frequently hear tip mice in there. Um, and it's just a, a, say a mix of, of different trees and, and shrubs, which would be beneficial. To, uh, to wildlife. So we do get um, a wide range of birds across the farm because we provide so many different habitats. We have big open grassland areas, we have cereals, uh, we have the, the long tussocky grass, which will obviously have seeds on anyway, things like the Cotswood seed. Um, we have very um, old, well-established hedges. We have uh, wetland. Um, so by having such a wide variety of habitat, uh, and old buildings as well, which provide nesting sites for things like tree sparrows, and we always get pie wagtails in the buildings as, as well. Um, this is actually, um, so we get house sparrows in the buildings. This is actually a tree sparrow. Um, and uh, yellow hammers, which of course uh, largely steel seeds, uh, reed buntings. Even the birds that are largely seed feeders, such as the, the buntings and the yellow hammers and the sparrows, they all need insect protein to feed their young in the first few weeks. So actually providing that range of small insects is really, really important. Um, looking at any form of wildlife management, you have to look holistically. Uh, it's, it, it's no good just putting out seed for the birds. Yes, they do have a hungry gap. Um, a lot of farm and birds have, their populations have dropped because they're literally starving in the winter. Um, but if you haven't got the insects there to help feed the young, then you're never going to get enough population coming through to, to need the food in the winter. I mentioned we have the, the river right and uh, our otters going up and down the river. Unfortunately, I haven't got a photo of an otter. Um, these are some paw print and um, we do see sprints as well. The, the, the droppings on a, a, a little, um, either on a rock or a little mound of, of mud that they've created to, to, to put their droppings on as a territorial marker. Um, and often in the sprints you can see fish scales, uh, which are, are show that they're you know, thriving in a um, in feeding from the river. One of the um, features that's listed in the uh, SSSI listing is the white-legged damselfly. So when the river was designated to SSSI in the 1980s it was the northernmost limit of this very pretty little damselfly, which comes out largely from uh, late May through to late June. And although they do go further north now, the uh, numbers on the River Eye are still quite spectacular. They, of course, rely on, on water 
for the life cycle in that the um, eggs are laid in water, the larvae live uh, underwater for a couple of years, and then they emerge. Once they've emerged, the damselflies actually will travel a fair distance from the river. Uh, so we, we actually find them sometimes just in our, our arable fields or, or intensive grassland fields, um, but mainly in our areas of rough grassland or hay meadows, because they, again, are looking for small insects, which is, which is what they'll actually uh, feed on. I've mentioned before at the River Eye, um, I haven't time to put lots of photos up. This is one of my favourites. This is a flowering rush, which tends to flower sort of late July through to August time. Um, it actually lives in the water itself rather than rather than on the banks, but it's a, it's a very pretty plant, uh, one of the ones found in the Triple SI. And then in a, a tiny little western, which is part of the Triple SI, uh, we have uh, lots of marsh marigolds or, or king cups in the springtime and ragged robin usually just very slightly later. So the triple SI is basically the river itself, including its banks, but it isn't the fields either side, apart from this very small area of wet grassland where there's a spring uh, that rises right next to the river. And um, no matter how dry the year, it's always wet in this little, this little patch of grassland. We work closely um, with BTO uh, ringers, uh, bird ringers, of course, they're, they're trained and licensed to capture and, and ring birds. And then for certain species, such as barn owls, um, you need to schedule one license. And uh, Chris Hughes, who lives in Mount Mowbray, is the ringer we've worked most closely with over the years. Um, and it's great for us to actually know what's out on the farm. Uh, and also to see some of the uh, recoveries. So occasionally a bird will be found dead either in this country if it's a migratory bird somewhere else in the world um, and, and also the retraps. So you might ring a, a blue tit um, it, it, in one year and then it, 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 either it keeps coming back. So it might come back several times in the same year uh, and then again the next year and then again the next year um, and almost, almost become as a personal friend. Uh, but sometimes they disappear and then four or five years later they'll suddenly reappear and, and you wonder where have they been in the meanwhile, have they been living in Mount Mowbray which is quite close by, have they been over to another farm um, and then even some of our, uh, our native birds um, will be found some considerable dis distance away uh, and then of course there are birds which we think of as native, so something like a blackbird um, and there was one that was caught uh, feeding on the windfall apples just after Christmas and then it was actually recaptured in Denmark three months later because uh, quite a lot of blackbirds do actually migrate uh, within Europe. So it's really, really interesting to be able to find out more about the birds. Um, and Chris obviously reports all of this in. And if any of you ever look at the um, Ornithological Society for Leicester and Rutland, if you look at their annual ringing reports, um, then, then quite often our site pops up um, uh, because, just because there's a lot of ringing activity on the farm. I've mentioned we have several field ponds. So this is in one of our permanent grassland fields, and this is a completely unshaded pond. Uh, you can see we've made some hay uh, on the um, grassland surrounding it. Uh, and then this pond is one of several local wildlife sites we have on the farm, partly because of the flora in it, but also because, like most ponds in, in uh, northeast Leicestershire, it has great crested newts in. Great crested newts aren't actually rare in this part of the, uh, of the country, they're not actually rare in the UK, they are rare on a European scale, which is why they're protected. Um, but uh, almost all of our ponds have them, uh, we have them in the cellar of the house, um, our neighbours have them underneath their patio, uh, they are all, all, all over the place basically. Uh, one of the very nice um, and quite picky um, damselflies that, that we get a lot of at this pond is the emerald damselfly. So they're not particularly rare, but they are quite selective uh, as to where they breed. And um, we do always see them around this particular pond. So I, I, I do like this one. And then the, you notice that pond wasn't actually fenced. Uh, some of our ponds are, some of them aren't, but allowing the livestock uh, access to the margin of the pond allows it to be poached up a bit. You can see the cattle, although they have a water trough in the field, have come down through the, the muddy river of the ponds as it's dried out um, and uh, they've poached it up a bit and aren't snipe well camouflaged. Um, about this time of year we get the first snipe dropping in and uh, as they come over for the winter 
and they again tend to sit very tight and I several days running I disturbed snipe uh, on the margin of this pond um, before I'd seen them uh, and so the next day I did manage to creep up to see one and then it's not a particularly brilliant photo but you can be sitting uh, with uh, a bit of zoom on the camera and a bit of zoom in the in the photo editing um, you, you, you can at least see the bird but yeah they are very well camouflaged and they tend to sit very tight so I, I mentioned we do have this range of habitats across the farm so this is that um, very open area down next to the river uh, which we uh, graze very extensively. We don't put any fertilizer on it. Uh, we don't use any herbicides on it. Uh, it just gets um, grazed by, as I say, sheep and then cattle. Uh, not the whole year, it has two or three months rest in the winter time. It's an absolute haven for skylarks uh, and uh, meadow pipits in particular. Because of the river, um, and we do get frequent floods in the winter time, then we do get a whole range of waders down there. So um, we often see uh, lapwing, we have had um, black-tailed gobwit, um, we occasionally get um, different geese, we had grey lag geese and things like that. Uh, we get curlew, so, and, and then other small numbers of waders occasionally dropping in. So it is, it is a nice area of open grassland. It's not open because we pulled hedges out, it's never actually been hedged. Uh, as I said, most of this is rig and furrow. So it's still remnant of the open field system. And um, because it is on the floodplain, then um, it's, it's, it's not been hedged and uh, it's not been cultivated since those, those medieval times. In our, we, we do have um, two acres of traditional hay though which although it hasn't got any rare plants in it they, they have a, a good range of um of native species in there uh, and this again is is where we look at managing holistically and looking at the whole life cycle in order to get um a diversity of um of different uh, animals and insects on the farm so this is chimney sweeper moth which is a day flying moth and the favored food plant of the caterpillars is pig nuts, which is a bit like a, a mini um, cow parsley. So it grows in the, in the hay meadows. Um, and because we have pig nut, we have chimney sweeper moths. Uh, so in order to attract certain species, you need to know uh, what the requirements are um, in the case of insects, not only for adults, but also for the, um, the larval stages as well. Uh, we're quite good at growing thistles. Um, and thistles are fantastic um, at attracting pollinators. Uh, you can see here, this is just a little clump in, a, in an uncultivated corner, and it, it's covered in, in meadow butterflies. Particularly, um, this, this particular spot is very well, sh very sheltered. So although it's a bit late in the year, for, it's too late for meadow browns now, but on a day like today, where um, it's very windy, then the, the butterflies uh, and at the right time of year, things like damselflies, they do tend to congregate where it's where, where it's sheltered, uh, as long as there's something there to attract them. So um, yeah, we, we're good at growing thistles. Um, although we do kind of control them, we're certainly never going to eradicate them. And you can see how attractive they are. Uh, this is meadow vetching, and um, again, it attracts a, a range of uh, a, a range of plants. One of the keys is have is making sure that we have enough um, pollen and nectar throughout the growing season. So um, on, on some farms or in some gardens, there might be plenty in the springtime, but there's nothing later on in the summer. Uh, or there might be plenty in, in late summer and autumn, but there's nothing in the springtime. So we try and make sure we have a good spread of um, flowers available uh, to support our insects throughout the year. Uh, and as a result, we, again, we, we get a good range of species. So there's a common blue here. One of its favorite food plants is um, birds for truffle. It's not what it's on there, but we do have birds for trefoil in the, in the hay meadows and some of the other fields. Um, I've only ever seen two brown argos on the farm. This is a very battered one. And then I did actually see one this summer when I was doing the big butterfly count. And we get lots of small coppers. Uh, those hay meadows that I mentioned have a lot of sorrel in them. And um, one of the favoured food plants for the small copper are, is the sorrel so for, for the caterpillars. So um, we often see two different flight periods. Um, and at this time of year, obviously the hay was cut quite some time ago, 
but we get a little bit of regrowth for some of the young stock grazing it now. And um, there are some thistles just coming back into flower again and some red clover that's coming back into flower again. And we're starting to see the odd small copper from a, a, a second brood. Um, and of course, they're, they're looking out for the, the, the odd bits of nectar that are around. Uh, this is actually spiny rest harrow, uh, which grows in one of the fields on the farm. It's actually our main cow grazing field. And this is on the red list for Leicestershire and Rutland uh, as a relatively uh, rare plant in the county. So uh, we have a little area within that main cow field where um, historically it hasn't had fertiliser on. Uh, and we do have a range of plants there, including this spiny rest harrow. So we do manage that area a little bit differently. We, um, we uh, graze it early in the season and then we shut it up, shut the cows out um, to let those species flower. And then we put the cows back in later in the year. I mentioned we're very proud of our hedgerow network. Um, Brent and we never had an enclosures act. So a lot, a, a lot of our hedges are actually very old. Um, it was piecemeal enclosure from about the 15th century. This is actually uh, one of the newest hedges on the farm. This went through shortly after the railway went through in, in the mid 19th century and it split a field in, in two and they put a new hedge through to, to make it more manageable. Um, and so this is mainly hawthorn, which is actually why it's laid so, so nicely. I didn't do this. Um, we use a professional hedge layer, although I have dabbled a little bit, but I'm not as good as that. Um, but most of our hedges are much more mixed species. Uh, so we have uh, buckthorn, gelder rose, um, ash, we have elm sucker still, obviously hawthorn, uh, blackthorn, all adding to the diversity um, for, uh, for a range of insects. And you can see there in, in springtime just the, the different colours in that hedge in the, in the foreground. There's a bit of field maple, not out of the leaf there, the brownish bit to the right. Some, some blackthorn and flower. Um, and uh, I say it's all that blackthorns ob obviously providing um, early uh, nectar for the, the insect, as I mentioned. And then, of course, one of the latest um, supplies uh, of, of nectar is the ivy. Um, there seem to have been particularly large numbers of bees on the ivy this, this autumn. Um, there's a, an old wall just outside the farmhouse here which it has lots of ivy on it and it's uh, something I pass every day. And uh, again, it's a nice sheltered little spot where, where it uh, catches the afternoon sun and it's been absolutely covered in uh, bees until today when it was windy and cold. Um, and we do manage our hedges to help provide a supply of nectar. So we don't cut every hedge every year. If you cut hawthorn every year, then you'll get very little blossom and of course, subsequently very little uh, berries for birds. So by um, cutting our hedges on a two or three year cycle and rotating that round the farm, there's always somewhere where there is some, um, some flower as well, and then of course, as long as it doesn't get frosted before it's been fertilized, then uh, we'll get a good show of berries to help feed the birds in the, in the winter time. We do have um, bullfinches, uh, you can see here the, the, the ring has been at work, a couple of lovely male bullfinches there. And um, I think one of the reasons we do have good populations of bullfinches is because we do provide a lot of that mature hawthorn um, and, and hawthorn in the hedges because they, they like eating the buds um, and I suspect the berries in the winter time as well. It's a really, really good year this year for, um, for most fruits actually. Our apple trees have been absolutely smothered and as you can see the, uh, the, the berries in the hedges are quite spectacular as well. And of course this time of year we start getting the winter thrushes. I haven't actually heard any here yet, um, although they have been uh, sighted around different parts of the country uh, so far, but um, we get lots of red wing and field fare. Um, again the, 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 the ring is obviously um, holding this one. Um, and as well as seeking out the berries, then of course they do feed on uh, invertebrates. So with all our areas of grassland um, and the, uh, the livestock on the fields, then most of the time they're actually, as long as the ground isn't frozen hard or under snow, they are actually feeding on the grassland. Um, we get great flocks of them flying off. You hear that wonderful chack, chack, chack of the, the field fares, uh, or you hear the, the seep, seep of the red wing. Sometimes you hear them flying over at night. 
um, and uh, so they're mainly feeding on on the ground. But then, particularly when we get a spell of hard weather, then then that's when they'll really uh, go for the uh, the berries that hopefully we provided for them in the hedges. So you can see them there feeding on a slightly frosted ground, but not not, not too frosty, so they can still get their uh, the, the beaks into the ground. We um, we tend to leave rotting trees in situ unless they're a public danger. So this is a very old willow, uh, and you can see there's a, a, a nice lot of fungi on there. And of course, there'll be loads of different insects within the trunk. Uh, even when they drop their branches, again, as long as it's not in the way or it's not, um, uh, you know, not creating a, a gap in a fence line so the cattle could get out then we, we tend to leave the wood in, uh, in situ. Uh, we might take a little bit for firewood, but most of it is left there, which is, um, of course, what's needed for a whole range of, of different insects. Again, we've, um, we've normally had lots of great spotted woodpeckers around. We don't get um, lesser spotted, but we normally have lots of great spotted woodpeckers. But in the last couple of years, they, they seem to have disappeared. Uh, I don't know. I haven't looked into whether this is a national trend or, or whether um, uh, they've just died out and they'll be back again soon. We also have uh, green woodpeckers which uh, like feeding on the meadow ants which are often um, characteristic of un unplanted grassland. Uh, one of the things we've noticed is that um, where there are cattle in the field the meadow ants never have a chance to make large anthills. Um, anywhere where we've fenced off, so perhaps next to a stream so the cattle can't go in the stream, the anthills will start to develop. Um, I, I just assume that it's the trampling of the cattle prevents them from raising a large anthill um, because they're obviously there because uh, I say as soon as we fence it off then, then we'll get them and then we'll get the, um, the green woodpeckers um, which are quite elusive um, usually very distinctive call so we know they're around but very hard to get a photo of and I'd say I just don't have time. Uh, we do have traditional farm buildings. Uh, because we're largely a dairy farm, we have muck and we have mud. And um, so we have loads of swallows. Uh, those of you that heard me speak before uh, know that I, I love seeing our swallows around in the summer. Um, there were some quite late broods this year. The last ones only left probably about a week ago, um, uh, taking advantage of that, uh, that nice late summer that we had. Uh, and we love seeing them around. Uh, the first ones normally arrive about this time we let the cows out at the end of March, beginning of April. Um, and then they are our sort of background music uh, in the farmyard for, for the whole summer. Um, we see them sweeping, uh, swooping low around the cows' hooves. Obviously, if the cattle go through um, the fields, they're disturbing insects, uh, swooping over the ponds and um, dive bombing us or the cats as they, as they go around the yard. Um, Julia, I hate so, to interrupt. Yeah. Julia, can you hear me? That's okay, I'm going to end. Yes, I hate okay. to interrupt, but about five minutes. Is that all right? That's fine. Is yeah, this, I've got totally the time. <laughs> um, the, so what does the future hold? Um, we are coming to the end of now 20 years of environmental management, um, which has been very rewarding. But we are we have applied for the next scheme. Um, we haven't heard yet if we've been accepted, but we are becoming a little jaded in, in that these funded schemes, they are very prescriptive. Um, so you, you get tired of, oh, the world is fantastic. It's the uh, 12th of July. We, we could really do with cutting the hay, but we're not allowed to cut it until the 15th of July. And you might think, oh, well, I can get away with it. But <laughs> um, then you realise that the Google Earth photo for that year was taken literally the day you cut the hay, so the evidence is there that you cut it. Uh, so that sort of thing, the, the, the stress sometimes of, of trying to manage to prescriptions rather than managing with nature can be quite difficult. And then some of you may be aware that the Mount Moby is having a um, loosely called the bypass, it's actually the a distributor road coming through um, to the north and east of Mount Mowbray. Um, a lot of survey work has been done as part of this. This was actually, uh, this is down next to the river, um, and this was looking at um, what's below the surface, partly because they're actually going to reroute part of the River I Triple SI. Uh, very interesting, but it will affect our farming operations. So, all that riverland is um, environmental scheme because, in effect, we're losing control of it for several years um, and it will be disturbing any habitat that we might, might try and manage. 
So I could talk until the cows come home, um, which happens twice a day on, on this farm. Uh, but my time is up, as you've heard Frank say. So I will leave you with a picture of our wind turbine, um, which uh, is, again, something we're trying to do. Uh, it, it reduces our reliance on fossil fuels to run our farming business. And we also export um, to the grid uh, as part of hopefully ensuring that our farm remains sustainable in all ways for the future. So that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much for listening. I'm amazed my internet connection hasn't dropped out. Um, so uh, thank you very much. Well, <laughs> thank you, Julia. <laughs> what an amazing, diverse farm. I, 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 I looked, uh, looked on your website and I see that you've got all that in just over a square kilometre. Is that right? <laughs> um, is that about 130 kilometres? <laughs> I suspect it's slightly more than anyway, don't I? A, a, a bit more than a than a grid square on an <laughs> OS map. That's some amazing the diversity that we've seen there. I'm I'm really impressed. <laughs> um, yes. So uh, shall I hand over to you, um, Harriet, to uh, go through some questions? Uh, yes, there's a couple of questions. I don't know if you can see them also, Julia. Um, so there's one from um, David, and he um, says, congratulations, Julia. What do you think are the barriers that prevents more farmers adopting the same approach? Um, I think it is, there has to be a passion. Uh, as I said, it's something I've been um, very keen on since, since my um, younger days. Um, and... Um, Funding is an issue. Yes, um, we've managed to tap into the funding. These schemes are competitive. So even all the farmers that might want to do this sort of work, you can't do it, unless you're very, very wealthy, you can't do it for free. Um, as anybody involved in the running of the Wildlife Trust knows, then most managing land for nature doesn't happen for nothing. You, you've got paid wardens, you rely on volunteers, you've got materials that need buying, you have machinery that needs buying. Um, so, uh, most farmers can't do this sort of work for free, and these schemes are competitive. So, more farmers apply, as I said, and we've applied for the next scheme, but we don't know if we'll get in or not. Um, so, that is part of the issue. It is actually funding. And then, partly, there is an awful lot of quote red tape involved. I and mean, when I just mentioned the cutting date on the hay meadows, uh, yes, we can get permission to cut it earlier but we have to get that written permission. If we get an inspection and we've cut our hay meadow two weeks early and we haven't had permission, we can lose payments on it. Um, so so there, is a, there is a lot of hassle factor. Brilliant, okay. Um, Bruce is asking, do you have gray partridge? Um, we don't, again, <laughs> They probably prefer um, arable land. Um, we do get the odd French partridge, but we don't. We don't get greys. No. We. I mean, we have seen them on the farm, but I've probably not seen them for um, ten years. And it's probably only a, you know, two or three. Then it wasn't a big covey. Um, most partridge, most grey partridge, are on um, estates and farms, which are managed very specifically for um, partridge habitat, and. Um, actually, a lot of the work that went into researching those wild bird mixes and, and the different cover crops that farmers grow now, a lot of it was actually done at Loddington, um, which is uh, run by the Game and um, Wildlife Conservation Trust. Um, and it was actually researched to help shoots, commercial shoots, um, often to encourage their grey partridge populations. Um, but it, it's now sort of um, focusing a lot on the, on the conservation work gets a lot of, of funding to research conservation work but that has um, been taken up by a lot of a lot of these options that are paid for under the, the management schemes um, is based on wh what they found actually works uh, through work that was done at Loddington. Okay. Um, okay David um, Duckett is asking 
Do you know how many species of birds have been recorded on your farm? Um, I think it's 104. I, I forgot to check before the talk. But obviously, when I first sort of started making a list, um, I think we were in the 80s. Um, and, and then I've been adding to it over the over the years. Um, we have benefited from having various specialist groups visit. So there was one day when I can't remember which group it was, but there were some keen bird watchers in, in the group and they spotted a peregrine falcon, which I haven't spotted. You know, I probably wouldn't have spotted before. So that was another one to add to the list. And then obviously things like red kite are quite common now. Um, that I remember being asked by one group, have you seen any red kites over the farm yet? And I hadn't, I'd seen them a few miles away. And then literally the day after that walk, I spotted the first red kite over the farm. Um, and, and again, the bird ringers um, are really helpful. So I know because of their expertise, and Chris in, in particular is a very, very experienced ringer and he does a lot of training, um, that we do have marsh and willow tit on the farm, um, which is, is, is a pretty good, um, one or two to tick really so yeah we currently I think it's 104. Wow it's amazing um okay Angela is asking do you have an open day at the farm? Um we used to run again through the stewardship scheme we used to run a program of farm walks which were free to participants and um, we've done quite a lot of these over the years and I'm sure there are some people listening in who've been on one of my farm walks and uh, we've had various wildlife groups amongst others coming um, those were funded through the stewardship scheme, which we're literally finishing next week. We come to the end of our current scheme next week. Um, I may there, there isn't an option in the scheme we've applied for for, for free walks. Um, so I might offer in the future on a paid basis. Um, I have found actually open days. Uh, again, given that we haven't got lots of staff and volunteers, can actually be quite stressful. Um, the last time we took part in the Open Farm Sunday, I'd literally just set up sort of three guided walks at different times and people booked on those. And we sat in the cars before the first walk while a torrential thunderstorm oh. occurred for the first 10 minutes. <laughs> Typical. <laughs> and there was another year when, because we were late silaging, um, we got literally nowhere to park people. It's just little narrow lanes. And unless we cleared a silage field, we had nowhere we could park people. And I think we got the cleared literally the day before the open day. So um, we tend not to do the sort of open days now, but but I will probably do some um, guided walks in the future, but probably on a sort of payment per head basis, but it won't be, won't be a large amount. Okay. Um, okay, we've got one here. Which plants would you recommend for our narrow 100 foot long village garden to maximize its usefulness for wildlife? We have trees, a very small pond, a variety of evergreens, and a few shrubs and a rough area. Right. Um, it got a really good mix already by the sound of it, particularly with because uh, one of the things when I was asked, people sometimes ask me is what, what one feature should I add? And a pond is what I normally say for that, we've got that. Uh, something like um, knapweed is, is really good. Uh, it's you know, normally found in hay meadows and on, on grass verges. Uh, really good at attracting butterflies. Um, and will grow on, on most soils and obviously soil type is quite a big influence on what, what plants will be successful. If anywhere on your trees you've got some ivy then again that's fantastic as I've mentioned for, um, for, for late summer in particular as well as providing somewhere for, for birds to, to shelter. Um, Although people obviously, when you're talking about butterflies, will often say, oh, buddlias, they're not native. There are plenty of them. And although they are providing the, the nectar, they're not really helping any of the, um, the, the caterpillars. Um, do make sure you've got a tiny bit of nettles in, in the rough patch, because um, that is good for, for several caterpillars. So um, I'm not a specialist wildlife gardener, but those that's my thoughts off the top of my head. Great, thank you. Um, okay, and so last question, um, unless any more pop up. Um, Fred is saying, thanks for the talk. Uh, why do they cut so many grass verges? And what do you think of the badger call? Uh, on the grass verges, uh, the county council, certainly I, I can't speak for Rutland, but certainly in Leicestershire, um, I know the county council have actually relaxed a lot of the cutting regime. 
So contractors now, I think they do one quite in the spring, um, one later summer, which I know can be the critical one for wildlife, but often it is essential for visibility. Um, I know on our um, junction onto the main road, if that verge isn't cut, then we cannot see what's coming, basically. Um, so they are aware of, of I mean, I, I've actually found Leicester County Council is very, very good on the environmental side. I've, I've worked with them quite closely over the years. Um, they are aware of the issue. Um, ironically, they get complaints from some people because they get problems with hay fever or it looks untidy or whatever else. So why haven't the verges been cut? Um, and on the little lanes around here, again, there are these sort of grips which are, are cut, which are there to help the rainwater go off the lane where there aren't any drains into the ditch. And if the grass isn't cut and you're trying to pull over to set so two cars from past and you hit one of those grips because you can't see it because the grass is long, then it doesn't do your car any good. So it, it is, they are trying to balance competing interests. Um, but I know they've got a bit of a campaign at the moment, uh, the county council, to if the community feels that the verges are being cut too often, to sort of work with the county council uh, to see if there are ways it, it, it could still work being cut less often. Um, on the badger curl, um, I, I'm not going to dwell on this, uh, and I know several people have heard my thoughts on this before. We run our cattle are our livelihood. We run a closed herd of cattle where we don't normally buy them in. There are no cattle in contact with ours. Um, we lost a third of our herd five years ago to bovine TB, the first time in 25, 30 years we've had TB on the farm. We've had a subsequent breakdown where we've lost several more cattle. Um, on the first breakdown, they took DNA samples from the TB that was cultivated, uh, cultured, and it was the strain which is most commonly found in wildlife. Uh, although we don't have badger sets on the farm, there are badgers traveling through the farm. Uh, APHA's conclusion was that RTB came from badgers. There was no other explanation, certainly not from other cattle. Um, on a, I, I have actually looked at a lot of the science on this. I, I took part in a, a specialist farmer discussion group on bovine TB, and we've had a, uh, access to a lot of experts, both on badger ecology, uh, epidemiology, um, the government vets, and I believe that a cull is more effective than vaccinating badgers. Of course, at the moment, there is no legal vaccine that we can use in cattle. A lot of people say, oh, why don't you vaccinate your cattle? Don't you think we would if we could? Um, we vaccinate for lots of other things. There is no vaccine that we are allowed to use in our cattle. Um, and even the trials that are ongoing at the moment for um, vaccinating cattle that can then be differentiated from cattle that have TB, because that's the important bit, um, the vaccine, which is the BCG vaccine, um, in the trials, it's only 70% effective. Um, bovine TB is an incredibly complex subject. And people are beginning to realise with COVID, which is obviously a, a very new disease, things aren't quite as straightforward as everybody thinks with, with viruses, with bacteria. Um, and you get lots of people talking about you know, immunity from COVID and, and um, antibodies, and no, it's not what we thought. And, it's the same with bovine TB. It is a very, very complex disease. Um, so for example, there is no uh, reliable test in a live badger to see whether it is infected with TB or not. Because that's one of the arguments is, well, why don't you test the badgers? And if they're infected, fine, you call them. But otherwise, why don't you vaccinate them? Um, there is no effective test for bovine TB in a live badger, unfortunately. OK, thank you. Um... Just check if we've got any other questions. Oh, the gentleman who asked about the plants in his garden has said thank you. Um, and we've got one question, so we'll have this as our final question from Stuart. Um, he's asking, what pests cause the farm the most problems? Um, as I said, we're alive. Well, I would say the one that has caused us the most problem is actually the badger. For the reasons I've said, you lose a third of your, of your cattle, and um, then that has caused us the most problem. Uh, other than that, um, yes, there are obviously things like rats, which we control, like other, you know, like like everybody does. Um, uh, 
depends where you take pests. Yes, there are there are viruses, there are diseases, there are bacteria that that, that again sometimes we vaccinate against, sometimes we can't, and they might might cause welfare problems in cattle or whatever. Um, but in terms of what people would think of as, as wildlife as opposed to bacteria and viruses, um, there's nothing that really causes us major problems other than um, what I've already mentioned. Um, yes, we have some rabbits, but they're not really a big issue. Um, we, uh, we don't grow, yes, we're growing grassland, but there are no major problems. Occasionally you might get a problem with um, leather jackets when you're reseeding grassland. Um, so, you know, the daddy long legs caterpillar um which can devastate a, a new newly sown field of grass or whatever um but um it doesn't happen every year and um you, you sort of just have to accept that's that's part of farming there are some years when you do have a pest problem okay uh can can eleanor just ask a quick question yes of course yes yeah. sitting sitting here next to me um thank you um thank you for a great talk julia um, I wondered if over the years you, you've ever get to know the individual characters of any of your sheep and cows. Um, I deal mainly with cows, uh, and oh yes, very much so. <laughs> <laughs> very much so. So um, because they're all born on the farm and spend their whole life with us, then um, often I'm there when they're born. Um, and then I'll be rearing them with a lot of close contact for the first uh, for the first winter, really. So they're, they're born most of them all September. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I've got um, Miranda the panda because she's got panda eyes um, who has her own little song that I sing to her. Um, she's actually now had her first calf, which is also a panda. Um, uh, you get the ones who learn how to open the door into the milking parlour because they want to get in and get their feed quicker. You get the ones that, I mean, we've got one at the moment who, um, she's a bit of a show jumper. So quite often she will manage to jump over. Luckily we have got good hedges, but we've got places where there's just barbed wire, like fencing a stream up or something. But she she is good at jumping over the, over the fence. Um, and she'll go anywhere just for that extra bit of grass. So she'll, she'll often try and sneak down the grass verge when they're crossing the road um uh so yeah they a lot of them do have very much a a, a, a character of their own <laughs> yes thank you well that's really wonderful i think uh, yes um over to you harriet perhaps to wind up you're muted i think sorry sorry <laughs> Um, okay, brilliant. Well, we've had one final question come through. Do we do we have time for one final question? Um, it's a gentleman's asking, do you have any sign of water bowls at all? Uh, yes. Um, the, I haven't done surveys, but um, uh, Natural England have done surveys relatively recently. And then because of the bypass um, coming through in the river and everything, everything under the sun has been surveyed, including water voles. Um, and yes, there are not vast populations, but there are water voles on the River Eye still, yeah, as well as um, white clawed crayfish. Brilliant, that's great news. Apart from okay. the white clawed crayfish. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, we've had lots of lovely comments also come in and come into the chat just to say thank you and uh, what an amazing talk and a fascinating talk. So um, it seems to have gone down very well with our with our audience. Um, so thank you very much, Julia, and thank you to Frank um, and the rest of the Odeon Wigston local group for organising this evening. Um, as I've mentioned, um, the whole programme of online talks has been uh, put together by volunteers and all our speakers are talking for free. So if you would like to give a donation for this evening's talk, you can do so at our website, which is just www.lrwt.org.uk and go to the supporters button um, at the top corner. Um, and if you would like to find out more about our local groups and um, what they get up to throughout the year, and if there's one near you, um, then go to the get involved section of our website and you can go to the local groups page on our website and see what they're all about. 
Um, so yes, so thanks again, Julia. It was a fantastic talk, um, very, very much enjoyed. And thank you everybody um, who's attended and um, hopefully we'll see you at one of our other talks. We've got um, several more coming up between um, now and December. So hopefully we'll see you there. Um, before we go, do you have anything you'd like to add, Frank, or? Oh. Oh, there we go. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yes, I've just I just qu quickly switched on the the YouTube and and saw this on the YouTube channel. <laughs> so I didn't realise how straightforward it was going to be for people. Um, to do that so uh i'll perhaps uh well we need to make sure people know if they don't manage to get a booking they need to know how how to do that but um yeah thank you julia thank you harriet and uh thank you everyone who came along brilliant thank you very much, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.